what I'm going to do right now.
Good morning. Well, I see a few more the first time I came in. So let's turn page 181. Today we're going to sing about the love of Christ for us. Mother and dad used to sing for all the funerals in town. I lived in a small town. And that was one of her, their favorite songs to sing. So it reminded me of them. They're both gone now. But uh, sometimes I'd have to go along because they didn't want me to leave home alone. <laughs> and and uh, there was one funeral where it was a bunch of kids. The mother had died. And my mother was having a struggle, you know, to sing. And I reached over to, I wanted to go out and sit in the car. And she just kind of pushed me away. So I went on out. She came back and she says she was about ready to cry. And she didn't want me crying <laughs> on her. So that's a little memory of my growing up. Let's turn to 183. I will sing of Jesus' love.
what a wonderful God we have. Amen. He's always there for us no matter what trials we're going through. If anybody else forsakes us, he won't. Turn to 192 of Shepherd Divine. Showers of blessing.
I want more time for Chuck. <laughs> so, and for the Pathfinders. So uh, I'll, I'll just start off here with an opening prayer, and then uh, we'll have Chuck come up. And Our Father in heaven, we just thank you for this opportunity to be here this Sabbath, and uh, we look forward to you being among us with your angels. We, we know you're here in our presence we, because you promise where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in our midst, and we, we look forward to that. Uh, right now, we look forward throughout the week to being with you every day, and especially on this holy day that you've blessed for us and for our benefit. So I just want to ask that you would <clears throat> be with Chuck as he's sharing his testimony, and be with the uh, Pathfinders in a special way. Give everyone your words to speak to that it would uh, have a positive uh, b blessing for us that we would draw nearer to you as a result. I pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Just want to read one text here. Revelation 12, uh, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. So I'm looking forward to this testimony of Chuck Stillwell. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And uh, I am so pleased that so many of you are here today. Uh, I can't even tell you how much um, um, your fellowship and your love to me this past year. I've been with the church for a little over a year now, and um, it just means a lot to me. Um, the moment I walked into this church, I knew that the love of God was here dwelling in your hearts and you guys reached out to me and and I'm just so happy to be in this home um, I'd like to start out with uh, Proverbs 22 6 train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it <clears throat> 59 years ago I was born into the Adventist truth. Our family roots on my mother's side of the family go back to the founding fathers of Adventism. I can always remember, I, well, I'm a fourth generation Adventist is what I am. I can always remember <clears throat> the story uh, that my mother was recounted to me many, many times. And yeah, when she was 12 years old, and my uncle Chuck, who I'm named after, um, was 10 years old, they were struck down with polio. And my grandparents, they went to the elders in their church and they prayed all night long. They prayed for their children all night long and, and my mom and my uncle were healed. Praise God. Well, from that time on, they dedicated, they rededicated their lives to God they gave 20% of all their earnings to God their entire lives. They dedicated themselves to helping children. Um, I can't even tell you how big our, our family is, our extended family is, because of their work with children. Um, <clears throat> when we, I can remember in my childhood that we would go to uh, my grandparents, they were farmers, my uncles are farmers, and we would go to their, their place uh, for vacation uh, two or three weeks every summer. We would go to camp meetings. We would um, go to family reunions. And, and everything that they did was all about worshiping God. And it was all about their testimonies. In fact, our family reunions would, would fill up a church. And it would be about what God had done in their lives. Everyone in our families would get up and tell what tell us stories about what God has done in their lives. They dedicated, uh, my uncles and aunts, and they dedicated themselves, as this church does, to mission trips. And so their whole lives were entirely about worshiping God and what the great things he had done for them. So during my childhood, we had an extremely, extremely consistent worship life in our home. And 
Religious music was a big part of it, our lives. The piano was a fixture in our home. My mother was a church organist. Uh, when looking at albums of my childhood, my mom always likes to point out the picture of me singing missionary volunteers when I was six years old. Um, I was baptized at the age of 12. Uh, we were taught to, to pray and, and study the Bible. My parents sacrificed to put myself and my two brothers through the Adventist schools. Through my teenage years, our worship life became inconsistent. Looking back to figure out why this happened, I realized that the main cause of this was a gradual influence of watching television, going to movie theaters in my later teens, and listening to rock and roll music. This affected my walk with God. Desire of Ages, page 519, Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. At the age of 19, I was married to an Adventist, Susan. And she's here today. Thank you. And God blessed us with a son, Charlie. Having Charlie in my life motivated me to have a closer walk with God. The first seven or six or seven years of Charlie's life, I was totally committed to God and my family. And then I started a partnership and started working 12 hours a day, six days a week. I went back to watching television and going to movie theaters in my spare time. I had bought a home and I thought it was pretty special. Uh, we went to church every week, but I was not having a meaningful relationship with God. I was happy to have a day off because I was exhausted. By the time Charlie turned 12 years old, work had become more important to me than my relationship with God and my family. My neglect of prayer and Bible study had caused this. I left my wife and eventually stopped going to church. Satan made sure that he put a woman in my life that led me further from God. Four years later, I was given an ultimatum to choose her or my son. I did not hesitate to choose Charlie, but because of my bad choices and lack of proper guidance, Charlie was already heading down the horrible path of drug addiction, which would last the next 15 years. Years later, when I heard Charlie tell me, that he had no hope of changing his life, and it didn't matter to him whether he lived or died. The guilt and the sorrow I felt for my son was unbearable. Matthew 7, 19 through 21. Do not lay up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up yourselves treasure in heaven. For where your heart is, there your heart will be also. If I had only pointed Charlie back to God at that time, but I was working seven days a week, and I had no time for God or my son. In 1993, I started a successful flooring business. My business continued to grow for the next 15 years. My heart was with the treasures of this world. The year 2006, God tried to wake me up out of my spiritual sleep. One day at work, I felt a terrible pain in my chest, and I thought I was having a heart attack, and called 911. By the grace of God, I did not have a heart attack and had two stents installed by angiogram. Also during this time, Charlie had given his heart to Jesus. I was thrilled, but because of his past, I had a hard time believing it was for real. Business was booming, and again, I was too busy, busy for God. Charlie made it his mission in life to bring me back to Jesus. For the next three years, he would call me almost every day, trying to persuade me to give my heart to Jesus. I know that I caused him a lot of frustration. Over time, the thing that really caught my attention was the changes that God made in his life. I supported him in everything that he was doing. We were developing a relationship that brought a lot of joy to my heart. His life had turned from darkness to light. And he was sharing this to anyone who would listen, especially me. My problem was myself. I had spent so many years depending on myself that I needed to be humbled before I could turn to God. October 21, 2009, a very special person in my life passed away. Rosemary, my wife's mother, she spent her last two months in our home and every night we would talk. One night her conversation turned to God 
and she had not been to church since she was a child, but she knew that I had gone to church and she felt that that was one of the reasons why I had such a good character and that she loved me. Rosemary asked me to tell her about God. I couldn't remember the last time I prayed to God, but I silently asked God to give me the right words to say to her. The first thing God brought to my memory were the past answered prayers of my life, and I shared those experiences with her. I told her that God was a loving God, and that no matter what we have done in our lives, we, if we confessed our sins, he would forgive us. I told her that if she believed that Jesus had died and paid the penalty for her sins, that he would give her eternal life. I also told her that those who believed in him would have a mansion built by Jesus in the new city of Jerusalem. Also, there would be no more tears, no more pain, sorrow, or death. She had had a lot of pain in the last 10 years of her life. Every night, she asked me to repeat these things to her till she passed away. I know I'm going to see her at the first resurrection. Thank you, God. I knew that God was reaching out to me through my experience with Rosemary, but I still did not turn to God. A few months later, I was in the hospital thinking that this time I really was experiencing a heart attack. I had all the symptoms. It ended up being a panic attack. I started thinking about my life. I had worked so hard so for so many years to give myself security as this world knows it and it was slowly slipping away because of the recession. I had never been in this kind of situation before. I had always been a problem solver and felt helpless. My addictions that I had developed over the years were affecting me physically and mentally. Smoking cigarettes, smoking marijuana, sleeping pills, gambling, food, and who knows what else. For the first time in my life, I was in a state of depression. I felt overwhelmed. I started to pray to God. But I stopped. Why would God listen to me? I had ignored him all these years, and all of a sudden he's going to help me? I didn't deserve his help. I left the hospital and did what I always had done, gone back to work. A couple weeks later, an elderly woman came into my store. We spoke for several minutes, and then she asked me a question. She said, can I ask you a personal question? And I said, yes. She said, do you believe in God? And I said, yes, I do. She said, I thought so. I just came to San Diego and I was looking for a nice church family to worship with. Could you recommend one to me? I was embarrassed and told her I was not presently going to church and could not help her out. After she left, I thought about our conversation and said to myself, did an angel just come into my store and ask me why I was not going to church if I really did believe in God? God knew the right time and place to send his messenger. I had a broken heart and was ready to listen to him and stop listening to my own heart. <laughs> Psalms 34:18. The Lord is near those near to those who have a broken heart and save such as a contrite spirit. Jeremiah 17:9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? I called Charlie and told him I was ready to go back to church. He was elated. Um, also, my aunts and uncles found out about it too, and they, they emailed me and said, all heaven is singing right now and praising God. So um, the whole family was behind me and praying for me all these years. Um, so we went to church together the next Sabbath for the first time in over 25 years. The first song that they played was I Surrender All. And my heart was broken, and I had to run to the bathroom. I was crying and asked God to, to forgive me and have mercy on me. For several months after, every time I hear, heard a gospel song from my childhood, it would bring tears. Music makes me very emotional, so if you see me singing and crying, you know why. <laughs> Mark 11:24. Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I say again, whatever things you ask when you pray... Believe that you receive them and you will have them. I experienced the power of God through this promise. I earnestly asked God to take away my addictions. I started with cigarettes, a two to three pack a day habit. One evening I asked God to take away the desire and from the time I asked to this day I've never had any desire to smoke again. That was the way I approached all my addictions. I prayed, 
I believed, and God did it. What an amazing God we have to help a wretched sinner like myself. Because of these answered prayers, wonderful things happened in my life. My anxiety and depression left me. I felt a peace of mind for the first time in my life. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When I gave my heart to God, that was when my real trial started. The first thing my wife Cindy told me was, if I had known you were going to be doing this, I would have never married you. Um, Nicholas, my son, has been getting mixed messages at home about what is right and what is wrong. But I do know that Nicholas loves Jesus, and his life is so much better because of that. A couple weeks ago, he was learning the Ten Commandments, and after he learned them, he confided to me that he had prayed to God to help him. I can't thank my church family enough for the love and support with Nicholas, especially Kathy and Jim. I don't want to forget Jim. Thank you, Jim. Everything that I thought was important in life is in danger of being removed from my life. But I no longer worry about these things because I have put all my trust in God. In the past two years, I have learned to continue in the Word, continue in prayer, and continue in His love. I learned this last Tuesday. My wife has stage 4 liver cancer and has less than a year to live. Please pray for her that she will give her heart to Jesus. I pray every day that God will give me the right words to speak to her. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. After taking my son Charlie, who was a down-and-out drug addict, and making him into a Bible worker and a youth pastor and the communications director for his church and all the miracles of God has performed and has continued to perform in my life, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Amen. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love and mercy to me and for forgiving my sins. Amen. Well, praise the Lord for that. that uh, I can't add much to that. But uh, I guess next we got to... Jim. Okay, I, I wasn't sure which one of you guys were coming up, so... <laughs> How appropriate it is to hear that testimony on this, our Pathfinder Day. And our Pathfinders are going to be having the worship service, and during that time there will be a baptism, uh, two baptisms. And because of that, we wanted to have the class presentation that would normally happen during the worship service during this uh, Sabbath school. So that's why you see so many of us here in our Pathfinder uniforms joining you this morning. And I'd like to introduce uh, two classes, uh, actually the leaders for two classes. We'll start with Frank and Elvia Spurgeon, who are the leaders of our friends class. And they're going to introduce the, uh, what our friends will be sharing with us this morning. The presentations have to do with the classwork that our Pathfinders do and working on, in this case, their, their friends uh, class and we will have an investiture a week from today and uh, the afternoon and I hope that you'll all be back then to encourage our Pathfinders as they complete their classwork. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I can just say what a powerful testimony. Amen. You know, it just shows us, train up a child in the way he should go. 
And uh, I've been wearing this uniform for 25 years. And working with friends has been awesome. Amen. Today, I want to bring up Josh and Isla. They are my friends. We've been working. Our Pathfinder says, a servant of God and a friend to man. And our job is to train these children in which way to go. But I want to say that pathfindering is camping. Fun things. What we do. That's the physical part of pathfinders. But our ultimate goal is to train up these children to lead them to the cross. And in their spiritual training, they have learned through the book many things. Uh, tying knots and, and in spiritual it ties it together that they have learned the books of the Old Testament in the Bible and today they're going to recite them. They know them from memory but I have them a sheet in front of them for in case they get stuck. You know how it goes when you get up here. Even for me you get a little nervous but what an awesome thing to do and thank you for your testimony. Amen. I'm going to move the microphone a little bit over and Josh and I are going to do the recital and my wife will be also helping me in the class. I'll put the, I'll lower that down from there. Right there. First we'll start out with Josh, and then Isla will go. Okay, remember. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. I will be reciting the five books of Moses right now. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Good morning, my name is Isla. I will be um, reciting the 12 books of history. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And Josh? And now I will recite the five books of, of the poets and the five major prophets. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. I will now be reciting the 12 minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And I would also like to add that Uncle Mo Streeter, he's not here with us today, but he's been a great part in also helping these Pathfinders move forward. So we'd like to give that, bring up his name. And thank you very much. Now we're going to have the next class come up. Good morning. At this moment, I'm going to be calling companion class, which is Elizabeth, Omar, and Joshua. And they've been learning the books of the Bible of the New Testament. I just want to say that it is really true about instructing our children in the way that they should go, which is the best way, because you know, what profit a man if he gains the whole world, right? Like the Bible says. But if he loses his soul, then there's nothing. So with the children here, as they're going to recite the Bible, uh, the books of the Bible, I just want to say that we've been through so much this year. Uh, sickness and everything, I haven't been there all the time. But I know that they love the Lord, and I just want to say that especially Omar. I'm really proud of him uh, because he was really lacking at the beginning. He was not so sure. But then later on, he was motivated. And I know that he has been working hard as well. Elizabeth, too, and Josh, he's a very committed boy. He, I know that they're going to do a very good job. Good morning, and today we will, huh? Good morning. Good morning.
they will be doing the um, the Old Testament. Testament. I mean the New Testament. <laughs> uh, I don't even have my game today. <laughs> Anyways, <coughs> Matthew, Mark, Mark Luke, Luke, John, John Acts, Romans, Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus. Once again, that concludes this portion of our Pathfinder Day, but there's much, much more yet to come. And we'll be looking forward to sharing that with you during our worship service. Hope to see you all there. Thank you for that. Can you, one of these, this working? Okay, I guess before we, uh, let's have a prayer before we um, uh, dismiss for classes. If any of the uh, facilitator, class facilitators are here, if they'd like to stand up. So we have a prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to listen to the testimony of your servant, Chuck, and the, these, uh, the work that's being done here for the Pathfinders. We just ask now that uh, he would go with us the rest of this day, be with us in the classes, help our, inspire our minds with your Holy Spirit to learn from you this morning things that can encourage us in our walk with you and in witnessing to others as we've been studying this quarter. We ask your help in that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're dismissed to the classes. There's classes here and in the other building as well. For visitors, the pastor has a class here. I hear you. Hello, hello, good morning. Test, test, test. Good morning. Okay, Albert, how are you doing today? Happy Sabbath to you, brother. Happy Sabbath to you, too. I'm going to get on mic here in a second. Okay, there's one right there. No, I have. I have. Oh, you got that. Can you figure out whose phone that is? Usually there's a personal. Person in the uh, Yeah, usually. Does it have a code or something? Uh -huh. Oh, there. It's, uh, it's Kathy's. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's Kathy's. Oh, okay. It's got to be Kathy's. It's got to be Kathy. David, can you close that door for me? Could you close the door for me?
Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. If I can just get you to move just a little bit closer, maybe one or two people, you guys are good. Just a little bit. my desk yesterday and we had some new students and uh, one of the students said to me are you an Adventist and taking my cue from lawyers and politicians I reflected the question and I said instead of answering the question I said why do you ask that question and she pointed to a jar I have on my desk where I keep goodies and it says Adventist help so she said, I grew up as an Adventist, so I, I know those things when I see it. And then I said, yeah, I'm an Adventist. So I said, we'll talk again. And I saw a student with a Bible in his hand and asked him some questions. And I saw another student with a Bible in his hand and asked him some questions too. So there's an awareness of some things going on. So, um, you know, just... I think the Lord sends us to places where, where he wants us to go. Amen? Amen. What lesson are we on? Okay, I'll give you, before you answer, I'll give you a hint. It's not 17 and it's not 19. Whoa, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in lesson number, that's right, 18. And we're talking about the signs so we could know that the church is true. Okay? So let's pray, and we'll get started. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, it's always, always good to call upon your holy name. It's always good to know from whence cometh our help. It's always good to know from whence cometh our salvation. And today, Father, as we study, discuss, fellowship, and even worship, that your will may be seen now and throughout this day. Help those who are suffering in some way. Help those who are rejoicing in some way. And we thank you, Father, for being such a good and wonderful God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. So why are you a member of this church? Do you think this church is uh, God's, God's church? I think so, yes. Oh, I wouldn't be a member of it. So uh, or does this lesson tell us your reasons? I think it tells me some of the reasons. You got more reasons. I have more reasons, yeah. <laughs> Where are we going to start? Let's start with question number... Uh, we stop at 13. So we had covered the top part of 13, and we we're getting ready to cover the section about God's remnant church, God's remnant last day church. Everybody see that? Yes? No? Okay. Is there anyone that needs a lesson? Okay. We'll get your lesson. Anybody else? I see two hands. Two hands. Up. Okay. One more? Okay, three. Three. What is the symbol for recycle? Okay, how many? Three arrows, right. Um, what's the symbol for carpool? What kind of lane does it call it? Diamond, that's right. So all through our um, communities, there are symbols for things. So turn in your Bible to Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 
17. And here's what Revelation 12, 17 says. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which do what? That's right. They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So in question number 13, it tells us what those symbols are. So the dragon is a symbol of what? Look right there in your lesson. The devil. Do you know that in um, ancient Chinese culture where they use symbols for words, that the word serpent is actually a dragon, hmm. which tells us that they knew the story of Adam and Eve. Okay, so the woman is symbolized as what? The tr church, right. Now, there are a lot of different types of church, so I want to be a little specific. What type of church is a woman? What does it say? The true church, right. Can anybody tell me, and this is by way of review, because I know I brought this up before, but where does the symbol of a woman as a church first seen in scripture? No fear, you can't answer. Okay, where in the Bible is the first occasion where basically, where's, what's the foundation of that symbolism? Where does it start? Where does it begin in scripture? Genesis 3. Genesis 3, that's correct. Genesis 3. Somebody tell me what happens there. It's the story of the fall, right? Yes. It's the story of the fall. Uh, Eve eats of the fruit. She takes it to Adam. He eats of the fruit. Right. And then what happens? Then they go and they find a tree, right? They're hiding. Why are they hiding? They hide it because their eyes are open and now they realize that they are naked and can understand different things. And who are they hiding from? They're hiding from God. So God, does God know where they are? Of course he does, right? But he still, you know, he starts asking them some questions. What have you done? You know, who told you you were naked? You know, things like that. Okay. And um, then he, 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 he tells the, the serpent something. What does he tell the serpent? He tells the, the man that he's going to work. He tells a woman that she's going to, what? Childbirth is going to be different. Difficult, yeah. Difficult, and what does he tell the serpent? You got, we need to, yeah, either get a mic or shout that out. <coughs> Tess. Wonderful testimony this morning, Charles. Yeah. Amen. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I want to take a poll. How many heard his testimony? Okay. Some of you didn't. Some of you didn't? Raise your hand if you did not hear the testimony. So you all heard it, right? Okay. Go ahead. And he tells the serpent that he will put enmity between his, his seed and the seed of the woman. Right. Mm -hmm. And who is the seed of the woman? Jesus. It will... <laughs> huh? Yeah, basically we are the seed yeah. of the woman, but the, he also focuses in on one particular individual, and who's that? Jesus Christ. Christ. On Christ, right. And so this woman that we see in, in chapter 12, who does she give birth to? Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, right? So so that symbolism that we see there is the this and, and the woman being that the symbol of the church goes all the way back to the Genesis three where God shows that there's as as you point out, Doctor, 
we're also the seed. Christ is in particular, in a unique and special way, he is the child of the woman. We are also children of that woman, and she was, she and her husband were the beginning of the church, right? Mm -hmm. What did they do on Sabbath? They start having children. What do you think they did on Sabbath? Rested. They rested. What else did they do? What else do you think they did? I think they uh, took time with the animals. The animals? Yeah. Boy, you just opened up a can of worms. <laughs> How come we don't let animals in here? <laughs> no, anyway. Well, we actually we well, do we sometimes. <laughs> but no, who else did they spend time with? With God. With God. And who else did they spend time with? Each other. Well, who is each other? Huh? I heard it. But who is in the church? God, Adam, Eve, who else? Holy Spirit, angels, who else? Huh? Their children are there. Their children are there, right? No. No? They don't have any children? Not in the garden. No, no, no. I'm talking about after. Oh, yeah. Remember, we've, we've already gone okay. through, you know. Okay. Genesis 3, they yeah. fell, you know, etc. I mean, wouldn't their children, you know, wandering around, looking at things, you know, looking yeah. at the animals and having a nice time, and then they see this angel standing there with his big sword. Wow. Do you think they're going to ask Daddy about that? I'm sure what they Yeah. Tell. What's going on here? Yeah. yeah. So on Sabbath, probably Adam... Preached a little sermon, right? Yeah. Told the story. So anyway, that's the church. We're the church. And um, it all begins in terms of the woman being a symbol of the church. It all begins right there. So ladies, you're a symbol of the church. That's a good thing. You <laughs> are a symbol of the church. Good. Ladies, <laughs> you're a symbol of the church. Isn't that neat? Okay, do you, yeah, you, what do you think? Do you think they spoke or did he just stand there like the guards, the, the British guards <laughs> that stand there and don't say anything to anybody or what, what do you think? You know, it's sanctified imagination. It doesn't matter. What do you think? Huh? I think he spoke to them. I think he would say, you know, um, thou cannot enter us or something, you know. Do you, do you think maybe the kids could go ask him things? Like yeah. Abel could go up and say, Hi, how you doing today? <laughs> yeah. That sure looks pretty in there. <laughs> What's that? What is that big tree over there? Oh, the tree of life. Oh, yeah, my dad told me about that. Yeah. Looks really nice. And maybe, uh, could you tell me what happened in there? Can you tell me what happened to mommy and daddy? Interesting. Never thought of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I could see him interacting with me. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, C, remnant. Remnant. So the word means last or end time. And then, of course, we know the commandments and the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Okay? Now look at the bottom. It says, let's read that verse. Remember we read Revelation 12, 17. It says, let's read it. Let's put it together in today's language. And it would read something like this. And the devil was infuriated with the true, true church and went to fight against God's church in the very last days, which keeps the Ten Commandments and have the gift of prophecy. Amen. Amen. All right, what two characteristics of God's last day remnant church are mentioned in Revelation 12, 17? They, what? The commandments. They break the commandments, mm -hmm. ignore the commandments, avoid the commandments. Keep the commandments. Huh? They keep the commandments and they don't have 
the gift of prophecy, right? Hmm. They have it. They do have it. Yeah. yeah. All right. So God's last day church will have the gift of prophecy and will keep all the commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath or the fourth commandment. Jesus is still saying, quote, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's impossible to really love him and knowingly break his commandments. There are many true Christians, Christians in churches which do not keep the Sabbath or have the gift of prophecy. How true. I was just uh, this morning uh, hearing the story of George Mueller, who was born in 1805, and uh, when he was uh, about 30, 31, 32, <clears throat> he'd already been, he was, he was recovering on the island of White from some bleeding problems he had, uh, stomach bleeding, I don't know, anyway, but he'd already started a ministry for, for children, you know, taking care of educating children and so forth from poor homes. And then uh, after his recovery, he began a ministry to, uh, you know, in those days they had poor houses where they were, the government would force people who couldn't pay their bills into these poor houses and they, they, they never got out of poverty by being there. Uh, it was just, it was horrible conditions. And so, and the kids couldn't go to school. So he began his orphanages and so forth and so on to uh, a great man of prayer, great man of prayer, great man of faith. Didn't keep the Sabbath, didn't have the testimony of Jesus. Great man of faith. God works through other people. And I think we should keep that in mind. That God still is working through these other churches. But God has called out a people to do something to, and that is to be ready in the last days to stand up and make sure people get the, the, the true picture of, of what it means to live in the last days, to prepare them, to help them uh, make it through those last times. And that's what the mission of this church is. Yes. That's what the mission of this church is. We're not better than other Christians. We're not special in the sense of, you know, they're down here and we're up here or something like that. Uh, we may, you can't say we have a special duty. And it's... Um, you said we can or can't? Can or, I'm sorry. Duty? Can or can't what? Do we, can, can we say or can't we say? I didn't hear what... Um, just we can't say we're special. Okay. We can say that we have a right. special okay. mission, you gotcha. might say. You know, like uh, you have a, a thousand soldiers and three of them are called to uh, go do some special mission. Okay, you know, that's, yeah. yeah, but it doesn't make them better than the other guys. You know, we just need to be careful. We don't yeah. portray ourselves as better than other people yeah. or something, you know, or we're the only ones saved. None of us believe that, right? All right. Charlie. <laughs> Do you need the mic, up? Charles? Do you need the mic or are you okay? I was just going to say that, you know, keeping the commandments um, also encompasses, uh, keeping the commandments also encompasses um, laws of health. Um, it's just not the moral law alone. Um, in fact, uh, when we read in the Bible about so uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, it talks about food as being one of their issues also, gluttony. So we have to, it's all encompassing the total laws of health and, and the moral law, and uh, I just want to make that point. Okay. To, to just to clarify, you know, remember what we need to tell people is that we need to obey all of God's commandments, and not just three or four or five or six, but all ten. So that's part of the special work that we need to be ready to, a uh, message that we need to be ready to deliver in the last days. Okay. People don't seem to want to hear that though. They want to kind of live their lifestyle how they want to and you know when they're ripe and old and probably like 80, 90, then take a look and see what the scriptures have. Really? Yeah. I've heard it. Anybody heard that? 
Yeah. So. yeah. Israel had prophets, but they made really fancy tombs for them. Yeah. <laughs> Bury their bones in Shechem. All right, let's look at question number 15. When I was in the military, I know, um, I see Brother Sam here, and I know he was in the military. Um, there are certain things you're conditioned to do. Like Sam, if, if at sea, if they wanted to warn you about a collision, what would be the sound you would hear? I'm sorry? Yeah. You go to general quarters or they will give some different beats and they had different sounds they would give you so that you could be aware certain things are going to happen. This one says three special messages. Let's look at Revelation 14. It goes back to the verse that says God will do nothing unless he let his people know what is going to come. So what are these messages? Let's begin at Revelation 14.6. If somebody could read that for me. Yeah. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of the heavens, having the everlasting gospel of the vision of the earth to every nation and kindred and son and people. Okay, if you could go all the way through... Um, What's going on here? What's being said? Let's look at the answers. Number one, it says the hour of God's what? Judgment is come. So worship him that made heaven and earth. That's the answer. Okay? Number two, Babylon is what? Fallen. So what do we need to do? What does it say? Come out of her, my people. Now, is that telling us to pack up everything and move to the hills? Huh? No. <laughs> what is it telling us to do? What does this mean? So that when you read it, how do you know to come out of Babylon? What does it mean? Yes. Come out of those systems, you know. Worship the true God. That's what it says. Remember, we read that in the first one. It says, it's fallen. Come out of her, my people. God said we are to tarry until he comes. So we will be here, living, doing what we need to do, but not part of the system. And the last one, it says, beware of the mark of his image. I'm sorry, beware of the beast and his image and his mark. God's true church for today will be presenting these three powerful messages worldwide. Many devout and local Christians and members of churches which do not teach these three point messages. However, such church churches cannot be God's church for today in which he is calling all his people because this true church must, pre must be preaching these three messages universally. So, so starting with the 1840s, right up until now, <clears throat> this church is about preaching these messages. We're even now calling people, to come join. Join in God's uh, true church, the church that keeps all his commandments, that's, that has, has these messages, come out of her, my people, 
and uh, a message about the, the mark of the beast, you know, and so forth and so on. But again, I want to emphasize that we could get very discouraged by our numbers if we, if we just look at that. We can say, well, you know, how effective are we being here in North America, for example? And often people will do that. They, they'll say, well, you know, we go overseas, we go to this country, and we have, you know, just people just coming in by the hundreds into the church. And it's true that it would be really great if we saw, you know, a great m movement, a mass uh, of people coming in to God's remnant church. But even if we don't see that, the, the, the thing that God wants us to do is to, to be faithful and loyal to him, to live uh, according to his word, and to be preaching this message because either we or our children or our children's children who knows when, just before Jesus comes, they are going to give this message and it's going to be extremely relevant at that time. You know, far more relevant. There are circumstances in the world that are going to make the, this three-part message here that you just went over, it's going to make it the most important message that people will hear in the very last days. And there will be a great, um, you know, there will only be two sides. It's going to come to the place where um, Satan has taken over the other churches. I'm, I hate to say those words, but anyway, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. He's going to take over and he's going to manipulate things the way he wants it to go and to turn on the truth of God. And we're going to have to be ready not only to stand firm, but to know what it is we're supposed to be sharing. Right. And this is it right here. Amen. This is the last message to a dying world. Are you ready to share it? Amen. Are you ready to share it? Amen. All right, number six, uh, excuse me. Yeah, 16. What other key point will God's true church for the last days stress? <clears throat> and they what? They overcame him. Let's see, wait a minute. They overcame by the blood of the... Lamb. They overcame, they overcome Satan's accusations against them, his attacks against them by the blood of the Lamb and the, the last part of that, the next verse says, by the word of their testimony. testimony right. All right. God's church will make very clear that salvation and righteousness come by faith in Jesus Christ alone. All right. Um, God's church defined. According to Revelation chapter 12 and 14, the following seven great points identify God's church for today into which he is calling all his people. I know what they are. You can't read them. No. The what? church, the true church has to have a steeple. It has to have Okay, I'm looking for a new <laughs> I'm looking for a new co-teacher. <laughs> Can I tell you a story? Yes. There was a there was a fella, I don't really know what what his occupation was now, but in any case, he was uh, he had some kind of funny ideas, okay? Okay. And um, but anyway, one of his funny ideas was that this church that was built and that I would just become the pastor of needed a steeple. <laughs> and he kept pushing that. We need a steeple. We need a steeple. We need a steeple. Mm -hmm. And um, this isn't really a good story. It doesn't really have much of a point, but it just strikes me as funny anyway. And so, he, he, so he um, kept pushing that. And I, I knew his work. Did he say why? Just it had to have a steeple. Every church. Well, see what they did is they, they, they built a church uh, out of one of these metal buildings, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it looked like uh, a factory or something. It didn't look <laughs> like a church, you know? <laughs> so he was right, you know? It, it didn't really look like a church. Yeah. I used to tell people, well, the reason why it looks like that is because we manufacture Christians in there. <laughs> we make, we make, all right, we make Christians in there. Okay. Anyway, so... Uh, 
the funny, another funny thing is they could have had a stucco, out, stucco outside for just $2,000 more. They could have had it stuccoed, and it would have looked like a church. Yeah. Totally different, but they chose that metal siding. Okay, well, he thought it, it just had to have a steeple. But I knew this guy's work, and I hate to tell you this, but it, his work really wasn't good work. Do you know what I'm saying? When he made something, it looked kind of... Yes. Shoddy. Kind of cheesy. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so he was going to actually, so, he wanted to do it? Yeah, he wanted, yeah. Yeah, he was going to do it. So I kind of, you know, I just resisted. Anyway, you know how things go. They move <laughs> pastors on. And the next time I drove by there, no, no, I, I heard, oh yeah, he put a steeple on the church. The next time I drove by there, I saw that steeple. It was the ugliest thing. <laughs> so... Uh, I sure hope the churches don't have, do we have, do we have a steeple here? No, I like steeple. I guess we don't rate then. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not the identification of a true church. I'm sorry. Okay. Break your heart, I know. What else? Did you have anything else? You no, wanted? we'll go by the list. Should we go by this? Yes. Okay, well, actually what I want to do is ask you to read the list to the class. What's number one? Sergio, would you read number one? Real loud, please. All right, that's number one. Comes after right. the Dark Ages experience and after 1798. Okay, number two. <clears throat> David, how about you? Uh, the whole same truths and okay, let's as apostles' teaching. Uh, yeah, let's use them. Thank you. <clears throat> will hold same truth as apostles. Teaching will swear with the Bible. Okay, thank you. It's going to line up with the, with the teaching of the apostles, which we find in Scripture. Charlie, how about number three? You don't have it? You don't have it? Okay. Okay. And you guys have it? Keep the Ten Commandments, including the fourth, seventh-day right. Sabbath. All right, amen. Here we go. We're listing the, the God's church identified. This is all. These characteristics have always been the identifying marks of God's people, from Adam and Eve to Noah to Abraham, Moses, Daniel. You know, David, Daniel. Uh, the apostles, Jesus. Okay, let's go on. Number four, huh? Charlie. Uh, page uh, seven. Page seven. There's seven. Seven. Yes. Yeah. We'll have the gift of prophecy. At all the time. God's people always have the prophetic voice, whether it's written or whether it's living, they always have the gift of prophecy. All right, number five. Who is going to read that? We'll preach the final end time three point message of Revelation. Now that's unique for this era. That's unique. But it is, has been always true that they always had a judgment hour message. Okay. Uh, okay, number six. They're going to go to where? Does Bob have the, do you have a copy? He doesn't. Okay. Who, who will read that? Read Somebody volunteer. Please. Thank you. We'll pre- Excuse me. We'll be a worldwide missionary church to every nation, tongue, and people. Okay. And it, is that a unique uh, aspect of God's church to this era? What do you say? I think it's, so. Has, has God's church ever been a worldwide work before? Yeah. We've seen some of it, a little pieces. Can we say that God has wanted it to be a worldwide work, right? <laughs> yeah. Did he want the Jews to take the gospel to the world? Yeah. 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 All right. Right after the flood, too, he wanted them he, to uh -huh. go and they built the tower. 
Hmm? Yeah, instead. instead yeah. Right. All right. Number seven. Number seven says, "Will preach, will teach salvation through Jesus Christ, the everlasting gospel." All right. And they've always, all through time, God's yeah. people have always looked for the coming of the Messiah. Amen. Amen. The Savior. Now, then, then, then when He came, we've always. Christians have always pointed back to him as, uh, as our savior. Salvation only through him has been our message. But uh, there are churches that don't do this, some of these things. Right. Okay, number 17. Number 17. Um, <clears throat> God give us these signs so we could know what to look for. And once we know, we should seek. So it says here in Luke 11, 9, it said, seek and you will find. Now, we know a lot of people use that for whatever purpose they want to use it for. But if you read the whole context of it, he's talking about finding him. That you could find him and you'll find him through, uh, you'll find him and then you'll find the church. Amen? Because a lot of churches build God in their image, and you really don't find Christ at all. All right, number 18. How many church organizations in the world fit these seven points? <clears throat> okay, so the answer is one. Question number 19. Once, once one recognizes God's true church, is it necessary to become a member or is it necessary to continue looking? In Acts 2, 47, it says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I'm going to go get the next lesson. Gotcha. It says, Notice the following. We are all called into one body. And even though we're one body, we still have different gifts some teachers, some evangelists, some pastors, and so forth. The body, that body is the church. And we enter the church by baptism. Remember, we, we talked about baptism before. All right? So, any questions on that lesson? Okay, starting next week, we will be looking at the next lesson, which is the mark of the beast. All right? How many of you have ever seen the mark of the beast? <laughs> well, David, you've seen it? <laughs> How, you have a question or a comment? Yeah. Hold on. Let's, let's get you on mic. Well, I think it's necessary to accept Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. Otherwise, we're in a very terrible danger. And uh, maybe that can be the mark of the beast. So you're saying, uh, let, me see if, let me paraphrase and see if I understand what you're saying. You're saying if someone doesn't accept Jesus Christ, they will have the mark of the beast. No. That's not what you're saying. They might be very in danger. They're in danger. Okay. All right. Good. That's a good place to stop today. So we will continue on that point next week when we look at the mark of the beast. So bring what you know. Bring what you've studied and we'll continue, okay? Could you dismiss us? All right, we're going to dismiss. Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Thank you for opening your words to us, um, giving us um, lessons that aren't clear, becoming clearer. Uh, may these um, verses and lessons guide us into the right path. Forgive our sins, Lord, and may we have a blessed day the rest of the day. And keep the Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.